Eblis, the accursed angel who rebelled against God, raises his citadel. From his cavern deep below the North Atlantic, the devil calls out to his armies using gravitational pulses. The subliminal code embedded in the Coca-Cola logo tells the faithful that there is no Mecca nor Muhammad. Plagues caused by vaccine, climate manipulation, alien flying saucers. The doomsday is creeping towards us. Late one autumn night in 2019, at a farm near the war-torn Afghan town of Musakala, a United States military raid ended the life of the author of these apocalyptic fantasies. To friends he'd played cricket with in the lanes of Sambhal in Uttar Pradesh, the slain man had been Samnu. The men he died with knew him by the pseudonym Asim Umar, Al-Qaeda chief Ayman al-Zawahiri's choice to lead the group in South Asia. Al-Zawahiri's speech last week assailing anti-hijab rules in Karnataka, the first by any Al-Qaeda leader focused only on India, underlines the threat the country faces. The global jihadist movement controls more territory than when the so-called war on terror began after 9-11. The rebirth of the Taliban's emirate has given Al-Qaeda a new physical sanctuary. These aren't, however, the biggest danger. In his speech, Al-Zawahiri invokes a civilizational war between what he calls, and I quote, the chaste Muslim nation and the degenerate and depraved polytheist and atheist enemies that it confronts. For decades, you see, Al-Qaeda has fought not just on battlefields, but in culture wars, conflicts about democracy, the rights of women, and religious identity. India's charged debates on Islam and Muslims' fears for their future means opportunity for Al-Qaeda. Al-Zawahiri's arrival in Peshawar in 1980 as part of the thousand-strong cohort of Arab jihadists who came to wage war against the Soviet Union was actually something of a homecoming. Abdul Wahab Azam, Al-Zawahiri's grandfather, had served as Egypt's ambassador to Pakistan in 1954. Among other things, Azam had translated the poet Muhammad Iqbal into Arabic. His friends in Karachi had included the exiled Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood leader, Saeed Ramadan. Pakistan's Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan had met Ramadan in 1948 when he visited Karachi to attend a conference. The relationship flowered through the early 1950s as Prime Minister Khan sought to Islamize the new Islamic Republic. The Muslim Brotherhood leader had his own radio show. The Prime Minister even wrote a preface to one of his books. The relationships that grew in Karachi led to intense engagement between Islamists in Pakistan and West Asia. Through Ramadan, the Egyptian Islamist Saeed Ibrahim Qutb discovered the work of the Jamaat-e-Islami ideologue Abul Allah Maududi. In Maududi's view, it was imperative for Muslims to, quote, seize the authority of the state for an evil system takes root and flourishes under the patronage of an evil government and a pious cultural order can never be established until the authority of government is wrested from the wicked. Islam itself, Maududi claimed, wasn't a religion. It was, I quote, a revolutionary ideology which seeks to alter the social order of the entire world and rebuild it. Through Qutb's work, al-Zawahiri, and other Al-Qaeda leaders like Osama bin Laden and Abdullah Azzam engaged with Maududi's ideas. In one essay, Al-Zawahiri even approvingly cited Maududi to argue that, I quote, democracy was a new religion based on making the people into gods and giving them gods' attributes. This is, Maududi said, tantamount to associating idols with God and falling into unbelief. For al-Zawahiri, as it had been for Qutb and Maududi, the answer lay in war. Jihad would lead to a government of the pious, the caliphate, and to the imposition of God's will on earth. In the summer of 2013, the new jihadist magazine Azan carried the first of several articles calling for Indian Muslims to join this jihadist movement, noting that their ancestors, according to the article, always raised the banner of jihad against the enemies of Islam. The red fort in front of the mosque in Delhi, it wrote, 
cries tears of blood at your slavery and mass killings at the hands of the Hindus. Instead of fighting back, the magazine lamented, young Muslims were, and I quote, wasting their time in marketplaces, parks and sport fields. From the late 1980s, waves of communal violence had led to a growth in jihadist recruitment in India. More important though, the violence had led to the growing physical and intellectual sundering of Muslims from the communities around them. Inside these besieged communities, the questioning of secular democratic politics had grown. Educated at the Hind Intercollege in Sambhal, the man who would become Al-Qaeda's South Asia chief was the youngest of five siblings. Sana ul Haq, as Asim Omar's real name was, dropped out of school in the eighth grade and was sent to the Darul Ulum Seminary in Deoband. The violence of 1992-1993 appears to have led him towards jihadism. Late in 1998, after dropping out of Deoband, Sanaul Haq travelled to Pakistan on a forged passport and gained admission to the pro-jihadist Jamia Ulum Islamia Seminary in Karachi. Following his studies there, Sanaul Haq is believed to have joined the Harkatul Mujahideen, serving for a time as a religious studies teacher at its training camps for Kashmir jihadists. The Indian jihadist's biggest contribution to the movement, though, was as a propagandist. He took Al-Qaeda's message to the conservative lower middle class, panicked by the cultural strains of modernity and disillusioned with democracy. Al-Qaeda positioned its moral certitude as all that stood between the pious and perdition. In one of his books, The Bermuda Triangle and the Devil, he wrote, I quote, the tragedy of all Islamic societies is that they grow watching devilish Christian, Jewish and Hindu media. The so-called modern class, he went on, are dancing to the tunes of prostitutes and calling themselves broad-minded, but in reality, their minds have been auctioned off in the markets of Hollywood. Gender was a leitmotif in his books. Muslim women, he wrote, have been persuaded that their community cannot prosper unless they leave the home. But in fact, they are walking into a trap. By weakening the faith of Muslim women, the devil succeeds in destroying their men. Pop Islamists, like Sanaul Haq, proliferated in the 1990s. Fugitive televangelist Zakir Nayak claimed that, and I quote, we Muslims would prefer that in India, the Islamic criminal law be implemented on all the Indians since chopping the hands of a thief will surely reduce the rate of robbery. Ahmad Didat, Nike's mentor, argued for polygamy, saying it would resolve the problem of what he called surplus women. 98% of America's prison population is male, Didat claimed. Then they have 25 million sodomites. Genius solution? Polygamy. Even in 1979, as Al-Zawahiri fought the Soviets, these kinds of ideas did not have a large audience. Egyptian leader Jamal Abdul Nasser erupted in laughter in 1959 along with his audience at the thought that women might be compelled to wear headscarves. Al-Zawahiri's own wedding to Aza Nawari in 1978, where genders were segregated and musicians were kept away, marked him out as a complete eccentric. Al-Zawahiri's own mother, Om Abima Azam, did not wear a veil, one obituary records. Mariam Jamila, a New York resident who lived in Maududi's home after converting to Islam, railed in a 1969 pamphlet for the hijab against Western values she alleged had unleashed, and I quote, an epidemic of crime, lawlessness and universal indulgence in illicit sex. Not surprisingly, in 1960s Pakistan, she was pretty much ignored. General Muhammad Ziaul Haq's regime began institutionalizing Islamist demands in practices. But the blossoming of religious chauvinism across the region needs a deeper understanding. For millions in India or in Pakistan, the state is a god that's failed. Justice, development and security remain elusive. Al-Qaeda isn't the only violent identity movement to have flowered in this toxic political landscape. The apocalypse Sanaul Haq prophesied and fought to realize might not be as far away as we imagine. 
Well, the unicorn told Alice in Lewis Carroll's masterwork, Alice in Wonderland, now that we have seen each other, if you'll believe in me, I'll believe in you. The real success of Al-Qaeda wasn't to bring down buildings in New York. It was to take millions into the other side of the looking glass. Finding a way back from that place of madness is a political challenge India is really going to have to struggle with. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print.